Welcome to The Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 21! It is episode 21! Hooray! And I almost laughed through that. You did. I saw you smirking. I thought, (laughs) should I put a funny face? (laughs) I resisted. You did. Well done. How are you, Nick? I'm very well. It's very exciting. Why? We have a Patreon... (laughs) We do. Which is marvellous. And we have people who have actually signed up for it. And you're all mad. But thank you so much. It's incredibly kind of people. An amazing first week. Yes, we are now live on Patreon, The Poisoner's Cabinet. And we are really overwhelmed that so many people signed up to hear more of our mad ramblings. <laughs> if you subscribe to Patreon, you'll be getting extra episodes from us and all sorts of other bonus content, which we will be flinging your way soon. But before we go any further, I think we need to thank our Patreons. I think we probably do. All right, take it away, Nick. So, well, thank you, huge thank you to uh, Real Life Ghost Stories. Of course. Abby Waller, Claire Alexander, Ian Harrison, Claire Cunningham. Tim Cloak, Debbie Robertson, Melanie Wood, Anna Nastasi, Chris Matlick. Vicky Newton, Lucy Sharkey, Aggie, Wren Bridges, Patricia Eaglesham Atkins. Shell Johnson Osborne, Deirdre Quinn, Daisy, C. Scott, Piet Free, Jessica Quinn, Weza Woo Woo and Jim Kennedy. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. We love you. You are amazing. God, there was a lot of names as well. Oh, Woohoo! A huge amount of names. You're all very, very, very attractive, beautiful people. And we hope you enjoy what you get for being our Patreon. The first episode is out, episode one. Head over to Patreon if you want to find out more about it, or just message us. How are you, Nick, otherwise? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. I'm just going to go with yes. It's been a highlight of the week, it really, has. hasn't it? It's been very exciting. Other very exciting development this week, Nick. Is that? We're in the same room. We are in the same room. We're in the same room. <laughs> it yeah. is now entirely legal. It is legal for us to record together so I can see your face. Oh my God. Rather than just a screen. <laughs> first, This week has been the first time recording together in three months. Well, yeah, since March. So yeah. It's crazy. It was a, a long time. I've gotten kind of used to... to yeah, Zoom's to, fine. You should probably yeah, leave. It's, it's much easier to edit. This is now going to be a hot mess, guys. See, I can do this in my pants usually, but no. Oh, God. <laughs> and of course, you threw on something special for I it. did. He's wearing jack boots and a bra. <laughs> well, Nick, are you ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? Well, I think people are paying us to do it now, so we probably should. Oh, well, we could we could drink poison and, and, and talk about cocktails. It might come to that if they stop paying us. Yeah, that's that's an extra <laughs> tier, isn't it? <laughs> that's, yeah, we haven't launched that tier yet. <laughs> <laughs> but soon. <laughs> well, episode 21, it is my story this week. Hooray! And we cannot go further. We couldn't possibly start on our story without a drink in hand. We have our secret ingredient, which is inspired by the tale that we tell. And this week's secret ingredient, Nick, was... <laughs> Gruel. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's an ingredient. Oh, yes, yes it is. It is an ingredient. It's a thing. It is also a thing. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how we're going to weld into a cocktail. It's a, it is certainly a, a challenge. Again, it was one of those ones where, do I go with a really metaphorical, strange <laughs> ingredient that Nick will hit me over the head with? This is true. Gruel, I'm, gruel. I potentially would have preferved that than gruel. <laughs> well, gruel, uh, yeah, it's not appetising. And I did search and to, se- to see if there's some sort of kind of bijou hipster version of gruel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, gruel is basically oatmeal and, and water. Yeah. And maybe with an odd bit of treacle in there and some salt for uh, if you're going to go crazy. Gruel, very famous in, uh, in Oliver Twist. Yeah. And in all those Victorian workhouse <laughs> stories where you served up gruel. I'm trying to sell it nicely yeah, yeah. as a literary reference. You know what, Nick? It's gruel. It's gruel. <laughs> you can't make it. You can't fancy it up. Well, I trust you, Nick. Uh-huh. And you have come up with something. We have come up with something. Yay! We have. It's a... Um, mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this does not bode well. It's, it's, it's a thing. Okay, so <laughs> what are we, what's it called? It is called an Athol Brose. I think that's probably pronounced very wrong because it's Scottish. So I'm not even going to attempt to do a Scottish pronunciation. So an Athol Brose. Something like that. Brose. Like that sounded Russian. <laughs> yes. <it is. laughs> yeah, we'll have to get David Keane from 50p Movie Club to tell us how to pronounce this. I'll, I'll cut this in later, just him and his deep Glaswegian accent <laughs> saying just, the name of this right. It. If we do manage to speak to him, here is the point at which he will say it. Athol Brose. And if we didn't, it was a really awkward silence. I didn't find it awkward. It's nice to have this quiet time with you, Nick. <laughs> well, an Athol Brose. Okay, so it's either got gruel in it, hopefully some variation of gruel that involves alcohol. It's time to mix up this curious cocktail. So mm. we're going to go shake up a storm and we will see you in a minute. See you in a bit. And we're back. Yellow. 
We've mi- <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. was that was an ordeal. That was an ordeal. <laughs> My God, that took a long time. The results we hope will will be lovely, but I'm, I'm not convinced. Okay, but so we shall find out. So the principle of uh, of this cocktail, we were thinking, okay, gruel is made principally of oats yes. and water. Is there? This is an oat based cocktail, like a porridge based porridge cocktail. based cocktail, <laughs> <laughs> which is in Diffords. It, I mean, it is absolutely, and it's a well rated one as well. Um, <laughs> so talk us through it, Nick. So, I mean, my God, the palaver of making this thing. Get your oats and soak them in warm water for about 15, 20 minutes before you can make the cocktail. And then you get that oaty, milky, watery goodness, which you then squeeze out of your oats. I've just realised we could have just used oat milk this whole time. We could have done. But that was the fun. <laughs> well, now we have got a real gruel sort of vibe going we on. We really do, because that um, was horrible. Not quite the same, well, really, I, is That it? is it. That's the hipster version of gruel. It's <laughs> freaking oat milk, apparently. <laughs> so we have our oaty water. Yeah. We have whiskey, Scotch whiskey. Nice. Uh, which we've dissolved a bit of honey mm. into. We have drambuie, which again is sort of like a honey, meady sort Ooh. of... Thing. That's about, I've never actually had Drambuie before. Kind of thing that you get miniatures of at Christmas. Yeah. Well, so I had to go and buy a whole bottle for this. So that will sit in the back of the cupboard for God knows how long. <laughs> well, um, it might be delicious. It like might be it. delicious. Amaretto. We like amaretto. Ooh, we like amaretto. Almond. And then some cream. And some cream. It's got all the goodness in it. So it is very Scottish. So scotch and honey and and, and porridge. Putting this together in the kitchen was almost an incident <laughs> because we nearly got everything wrong and we're pretty much crying. But so, we're going to dive in with our, what's it called again? Athol Boozy. Let's have a sip. Well, mm, <laughs> I mean, it's not, I say it's not unpleasant. I don't know what it is, Nick. It's um. Oh no! Oh. It's the whiskey comes through, and it's the dra- no, it's the drambuie. I now I know what drambuie tastes like. It's re- It's not unpleasant. It's incredibly sweet. It's very creamy, but with that shock of whiskey drambuiness in the background, it's, it's very it's weird. <laughs> I don't know whether it's good or bad. Yeah, it's um. I think we mm. overdid it on the There's honey. Too much honey. Well, well, Nick said four spoons of honey, and I got well, well, this spoon, and he went, yeah. And then as I was putting in the last spoon, he went, you probably meant a bar spoon. I was like, oh, for God's sake. It was, it was just a spoon. So spoons. I, thought, so like, <laughs> I was getting a huge shovel, and he had wang. <laughs> well, I don't really taste the porridge, as it were. No, I think that's probably, I don't know, just to add to its Scottishness. But I mean, the, the legend behind this, which I think is probably utter nonsense, this cocktail was created by the Earl of Athol. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, in 1475. Nice. Okay, when he was trying to capture Ian MacDonald, who was Lord of the Isles and leader of a rebellion. So, dear old Ian MacDonald in his castle somewhere on an island, which was being sieged by the Earl of Athol. The <laughs> Earl heard rumours that MacDonald was drinking his water from this little small well, okay. um, and that's how he was surviving through this siege. So the Earl ordered it to be filled with honey, whiskey and oatmeal brilliant to taint the well and force them out of this siege <laughs> what but why would you use those things to that's taint the well that's delicious that's delicious like put poo in there or something <laughs> or, or dead things they've learnt nothing from the siege of Rochester bring exactly. me the fact of 40 pigs this <laughs> man he needs honey and oats and some exactly. whiskey <laughs> he'll hate that yeah. I mean there's a Scotsman in a, in a <laughs> castle and you're filling his well with whiskey and you know, the Scotsman's going to go oh no I don't like that I better leave so I've got a feeling the Earl of Athol was probably like a really stupid Englishman um, <laughs> so. he wasn't good at his tactics <laughs> so, so that's probably where it comes from which I think is probably hard highly dubious um, I think that's great but it's, though, a, brilliant, it it's a brilliant story this is a strange take on it as We've it's, got str- it's strong and it's sweet and it's power <laughs> don't, you know what it's like a weird sort of Baileys it's like mm. it is like a Christmas drink because I think Drambuie is one that people get out at Christmas or it's a liqueur that your grandmother has or they're in liqueur chocolates it's um <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. I don't know either. I it's can't say bad. that I like it, but it's not terrible. It's probably not one I will go, oh, I'll have another one of those. It feels like a 70s dinner party so all of a sudden. It does. I mean, well, you it... know what? I'm half tempted. Add a bit of mint in there or something. Go, just go for it, Nick. Because <laughs> I'm thinking a little bit of creme de menthe might. It might actually be it all right. Be all right. Well, <laughs> I swear, making this cocktail, I I was bringing ingredients over. I use milliliters. Nick used ounces. There was a moment we were standing in the kitchen, sort of huddled over this, going, "Right, what quantity are we supposed?" To? I put in four of these. Four of what? 
But in the end, we've made something fun. Made something that's multi-talked about. Exactly. <laughs> well, we have our cocktails kind of in hand. Kind of, yeah. Kind, kind yeah. of in hand, sidling down there, yeah. down the street. Well, from the Earls of Scotland, shall I take you on a tale? I want a tale. A tale that has been requested by one of nice. our dear listeners. We're going to go back. We're going to go back in time. Back in time. We are going to flock to Georgian England. Oh, how very civilised. Oh, how very civilised. Is oh, it's... Cornelius around? Cornelius is not around, oh. unfortunately. No, no, no. No, we're in early, early Georgian England. Early, early Georgian. Nothing really happened. <laughs> no, at this time period... Yes, a lot of balls. A lot of balls. But all the good people that we think about uh, from the Georgian Regency era, so the likes of Austin and Mary Shelley and Wordsworth and any of the romantics, we're, we're a few years away yeah. from them being born. And we're also out of the kind of debauchery of Charles the second and the big hats with ships in them so it's dull times well it's an interesting time for today we shall discuss the tale of mary blandy quite the tragedy um, or was it ooh. but let me read you an excerpt from the very brilliant newgate calendar do you know of the newgate calendar i don't but i knew Newgate was a prison so was it their sort of roster of executions? Or the something? Newgate Calendar was a book, and it was around this sort of time in the seventh, in the eighteenth and nineteenth century, probably the third most common book that would be found in households. It started off a list or a compendium of executions of tales of people right. of wrongdoers, these very embellished true crime stories, and these books of all of these ne'er do wells and these wrongdoers, and that they were kept they were kept in the households, and children would read them, and mothers were encouraged to give them to their children. So so the children would read it and go, ah, I must never fall down this path. The Newgate calendar, a real thing. Look it up. To me, it sounds like, almost like I'm used to have cinema listings in the, in the, <laughs> in the, in the, in the paper. You go, oh, who's been executed on Tuesday? And you flick through and go, oh, so-and-so. Better go and say that one. That'll be Pretty a good much. one. <laughs> That'll be good. I think calendar is more of a record. Yes, more indeed. More of a record. <laughs> but I should read you an excerpt from the Newgate calendar about this case. And bear in mind the time at which this is written. So you've got to think, I suppose the closest thing, Jane Austen, but shit. <laughs> Uh, okay. In a moral point of view, though the law may not immediately overtake the villainy, we would appeal to the hearts of the readers of our own sex. Nay, we would ask the question, in cooler moments of youth, can there be a more destructive vice than the seduction of a virtuous female under promise of marriage? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's quite quite a dramatic entrance yes austin but shit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes we are in early georgian england so in the 1700s mary blandy was born in 1720 and she died in 1752 aged oh, 31 so a time before austin before mary shelley even before cornelius van vinkbooms he's immortal uh two things happen around this time uh, the Whigs get in to parliament and uh, there's been a smallpox inoculation Hey. Fun, fun times. Mary Blandy was raised in Henley on Thames. Oh, that's Oxfordshire. quite civilised. Very civilised, yes. Well, it is now. I don't know who it was at the time. Oh, it was. What a lovely spot. Home yes. of the regatta, quite, don't you know? Quite. A regatta. I went once. It's very fancy. Did you? I used to live in Reading, which is nearby. So you just tried to cross and the border some, over into Oxford. <laughs> no. Were you allowed to stay? I, I was there for about half an hour and got very, very bored. And also, I didn't have any pink trousers, so... For those who don't know, the regatta. It's regatta fancy. gala. Yes, it's just boats. boats. Lots, of, lots of boats. On a very, very beautiful part in uh, of Oxford. Now, Mary Blandy born into a very good family. We are talking about someone who was uh, very, very middle class, now well to do. The only child of Francis Blandy, who was a lawyer, and the town clerk of Henley, and her mother, Anne, who was also there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's just, just around in the background? Who's just there? The parents were very, very fond of their daughter. They could, they were said to scarcely bear her being out of their sight. They absolutely loved her. Well, you won't find many parents who say they aren't fond of their daughter. <laughs> that daughter of mine, I can hate her. No, they fussed over her a lot. <laughs> the, you, okay, this is speaking volumes about your childhood now, Nick, isn't it? <laughs> oh, the parents love being with their children. Pff, that's idiotic. <laughs> she was never locked in a cellar. <laughs> By all reports, Mary was well-mannered, well-educated, well-liked, well of face. I made that last expression up. <laughs> she was pretty. She was pretty. That's what we can say. No, but very, very nice young woman. Her parents took a lot of time over her education, over her manners. She was very well-liked in, in Henley-on-Thames and was a very nice young woman by all accounts. Her manners were sprightly, as was said. <laughs> and she was a good conversation. Well, quite. Which we all want in well, Georgian yes. England. Not much else to do, really. There's not much else to do. I'll have a chat. You can't go on the Netflix. No, you, you, go to, you go to a drawing room and take a turn around the room. <laughs> and then you go back the same way and comment on how the room was. <laughs> the Blandy home was a place of much gaiety 
They said Francis Blandy was a prosperous man. He kept a nice house. He was so well off, in fact, that he was able to proclaim a dowry of for young Mary of ten thousand pounds. Well, that's quite a lot of money in that day and age. Oh yeah, that's an awful lot. Yeah. And in those days, again, if you publicise as you did the dowry that you'd be offering for your daughter you're going to get a lot of interest yeah, probably a lot of nutters as well yeah the money obviously attracted a lot of suitors uh, during her youth she rejected all of them so we can only imagine the kind of rough and tumble characters who were rocking up to the door <laughs> with a top hat and a monocle made out of cardboard kind of <laughs> pretending to be aristocrats she rejected all of them all of the suitors who came to the door obviously knocking and saying 10 grand yes whatever I'll take her none of them were for her and sort of not for her father either her father was quite um, particular about who was going to marry his daughter. He loved her very much. They were really holding out for a gentleman from the army. That's what they wanted. They wanted a man of nobility, but who had served in the army Mm. or had some career ahead of him. That would be good enough for young Mary. And so it was, at the age of 26, Mary met the Honourable Captain William Henry Cranstown, then aged 46. Right. Okay. Yes. He was the son of a Scottish lord, so very, very well connected with Scottish nobility. Earl of... Rosie. Athol. <laughs> Earl of Athol, yeah, that's right. No, he wasn't. It wasn't the Earl of Athol. It would be great if it was. If it, it was. turns out that it was, actually, <laughs> this hasn't come up. No, he was very well connected. He ticked all the boxes. He uh, served in the army. He bought a commission in the army. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as one does. As one does. But, you know, he was a captain. All very good. Apparently, he wasn't very attractive. I mean, he's 20 yeah. years older than her, but it was remarked later on, again, in another brilliant piece from the Newgate calendar. He was so marked with the smallpox... <laughs> That his face was in seams. Oh, God. Isn't that great? <laughs> and, and, he squinted very much. Nice. Nice. <laughs> sexy, sexy man. So squinty, ragged face, trying to peer out the woman. But, they said, he possessed that faculty of small talk, which is unfortunately too much esteemed by many of the fair sex. <laughs> yes, They do a- go on a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he was a charmer that was it he could talk his way into her house and hopefully her pants the face didn't matter he was charming and daddy liked him daddy liked him mary probably is bloody desperate right now because she's 26 <laughs> yeah, almost past it really yeah she's old she old. old their courtship begins the pair begin to walk out in henley over the coming weeks and months the gentle courtship begins but yes they walk down by the river they watch the boats they go to the regatta, which I don't think had started then. <laughs> they started it. They, they built started. their own regatta. Yes, and there they would sit in the twilight, waving handkerchiefs at each other across cucumber sandwiches. On one such occasion, one such occasion, William takes Mary's hands in his, and he looks deep in her eyes, and he utters those magic words. I'm already married. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Not what I was expecting you to say, I must admit. It's what every girl wants to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> In 1745, William Cranston had married one Anne Murray in Scotland. Uh, and they'd had a child together. Ooh, Possibly two. Oh Most people say one. I think others embellished it and said he had 15 children <laughs> by this woman, but definitely at least one child. He also received quite a tasty fortune from her as well. Uh, what are the worst words someone's ever said to you on a date? <laughs> Or is this tugging at a thread? <laughs> yeah, no, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to the sea. <laughs> but this much is true that William is married, but he puts a co- creative spin on it for Does Mary. He, he tells her, he tells her that he is married, so he's not completely trying to lie but he does make it a bit creative he says to her that he is involved in a lawsuit with a woman in scotland who claims to have a claim on him but the whole process it's all very silly and he's he's taking legal proceedings against her it will all be dealt with an annulment will be reached and he asks her darling will you wait until it's all dealt with darling will you wait for me will you wait for me until i get my first wife to fuck off <laughs> yes i will my love oh, oh why do people do this it's a love story of the ages <laughs> says, yes you will wait for me great one more thing please don't tell your father <laughs> but she agrees to this she's so so in love i mean she is 26 mary but she's pretty damn naive yeah well you, you don't have much of a life really did you back then well she's only seen the banks of henley yeah exactly she doesn't yeah. know the way of the world and seems like she's been pretty sheltered by yeah. her parents as well but she agrees to this she will not tell her father she's going to wait however it's only a matter of time before a mutual friend of both francis blandy mary's father and the captain 
writes to Francis and tells him that his future son-in-law is already wed. Oh, that's going to put a dampener on things. It's not going to be good. Yeah. You see, Daddy is furious. His precious yeah. baby. Cranstown, again, William, he is insistent. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. It's basically fine. It's all really a matter for the court. Well, he just is still spinning this story that this has just been a marriage of convenience. He did something out of gallantry. Maybe he is making up all sorts of stories. Is it even his child? Is it just he did something to protect the noble, crazy woman who was walking by? He was cursed to, to marry this woman until he learned to love again. <laughs> Taylor's old at the time. <laughs> but he says it's all going to be cleaned up swiftly. I have proceedings with the court. Daddy is sceptical. Mm. But Mummy, Blandy, she is completely on William's side, along with her daughter. Yes, Mummy, Blandy, really, really, really likes William. How, how really, really? She's clearly got an infatuation oh, with dear. him. Now, nothing happens between them, but the reports are of her reactions around William are just a bit mad. She she is taken in in the same way that her daughter has been about by his charm and his way with words. His dashing captainly ways. His dashing captainly way, his face like a hedge. <laughs> He's not a handsome man, as you said. But yet there's one point, I mean, during all of this courtship and all of these proceedings, that the mother falls ill uh, at a friend's house and she needs to have treatment and she starts crying out, send for Cranston, send Send, send, send for William. He must come and look after me. And her daughter's there as well. But like he, she gets him to come and administer medicine to her. Uh, that's that's it, mm. creepy. Yeah, that's weird. Creepy. And then they're saying to him, "Oh, I surely would have died without if you weren't here to comfort my daughter." <laughs> oh no, that's that's a bit desperate, Mrs. Blandy. Yes, but you can yeah. imagine then that Mrs. Blandy is in her husband's ear, going, "No, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah, make keep, him stay. Keep him around. I really fancy him. <laughs> yes, he should stay in our. He should <laughs> stay in our bed, and I'll keep an eye on him." <laughs> Possibly the shiny red uniform that he would have had. There was a red uniform at that time. I don't know if it was at that time. You just put one on. (laughs) Maybe. The fancy uniform does wonders. If you were senior, if you were a captain or a major or an admiral or anything, you wanted people to know because everyone would go, ooh, hoo, 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 he fancy. Aren't you fancy? Aren't you fancy? Ned has given him free cake. (laughs) But William at this time, he's travelling back and forth from Scotland, so he says. It turns out this marriage of his is not as easy to end as mm. he would have people believe. Now, the reports are that Anne, his first wife, uh, reneges on her supposed deal that she will grant an annulment. She's a bit like, no, no, don't really want to. a child. You can't have an annulment if they've got a child. There we go. He's going to the courts. He keeps putting this case forward, saying, I want to have the marriage annulled. It's not It's not valid. I, I, you know, fine in favour of me. He goes twice, apparently, to the courts, and each time it is rejected. They're like, no, no, this marriage is genuine. Yes, you, you, you've, you've had sex with this person. There's a child, so... <laughs> there we go. Look at it. You're having sex with her now, <laughs> yes. in court, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. It, this is going on for months and months and months, and Daddy Blandy, Francis Blandy, is, is getting fed up. He's really getting fed up. He's listened to his wife, who is now just just licking pictures of, of, of the captain. <laughs> She's just making all these sewing kind of crochet things of his face. The daughters are sitting there, innocent as anything, staring off. La, 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 la. Waiting for him to ride over the hill. One day my prince will come. <laughs> naive little baby <laughs> he's fed up he's like enough is enough this is this is stupid i don't he's, he's like i don't believe he is going to end his marriage thinks his daughter is wasting time waiting for him and he's pretty vocal about this he doesn't want he doesn't want william in the house anymore he doesn't want this to go ahead he hasn't put a, a hard stop to it but he's being very vocal in the fact that if you do propose marriage and you do come back i'm not going to be okay with it william is now a bit desperate of course mary is distraught as well but william is now thinking okay okay this is all stumbling out of control obviously i love mary i love mary i love mary 10 grand 10 grand 10 grand 10 grand (laughs) he's writing to her back and forth and she's pleading with him and he's saying don't worry it won't be long and in one letter he writes to mary and he tells her you know around about your father just needs some some persuasion some gentle persuasion to help him see the good we just need to get him on our side and in this letter he encloses a little parcel of love potion. Oh. A love filter. We so never have good things with love potions. He encloses this in the letter. Doesn't specify what it is. Just says this will help. Well, help who? In so many words. Help their cause. Help right. to bring daddy on side. So he's expecting Mary to take this potion. He's expecting Mary to give it to her father. Right. Yes. So this she's got is... this letter going, here's this love potion. Give it to your father. Yes. That he will make him love William. Right. <laughs> and this Mary going, uh, where, where do I stand in all this? <laughs> the captain is going to run off with my father. 
<laughs> he's got my mother on side already. Yes. The exact wording of what was in the letter was a bit contested. Again, this has come into a bit of folklore. There was one piece that was so over the top. I was like, there's no way that that's real. <laughs> but we know that he says that he needs to take, this is a love potion for the father, a love um, filter it's called at the time a ph mm-hmm. and he doesn't explain what it is and he doesn't really give instruction to mary mary who is an idiot just goes yay daddy will <laughs> love him like doesn't question it that, that her dad will be randy as hell clearly <laughs> there is mary with this love potion this lovely packet of love potion that she's clutching to her chest and one sunday evening her father calls for some refreshment that the ma- this maids bring up and she takes it off the maids and goes please allow me to bring him his tea and his gruel. <laughs> Why is he eating gruel? I have no idea, but it's in every report that she brings up gruel. What is, he, is he thinking, I own a fucking big house. Why have you bought me a tray of gruel? <laughs> <laughs> I want a roast chicken. Maybe he's. The, maybe that's why he's rich. He's lived well, on gruel his yes. entire... Tea all, and gruel. That's all he's eaten for the past <laughs> 40 years. So yeah, probably why he's wealthy. There's some, there's some idea that maybe he wasn't feeling that well or maybe he had a stomachache and he'd called for some porridgey Something water. Simple. But literally it is that he was brought porridge, water and tea. Or maybe she just brought it up of her own accord. Either way, he just like, is, okay, thank you. Mm. <laughs> yeah. mm, lovely. But she takes the food, the tray of terrible food from the servant <laughs> and she slips in some of the powder. Lives it to daddy. There you go, daddy. Daddy. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, it's grueling. Oh, it's grueling. It's grueling. It's, oh, it isn't long before Daddy mm. becomes violently ill. Gruel will do that. Yep, it will. If you have too much porridge and you haven't, you know, <laughs> watered it down enough, that's just going to clog up your insides. <laughs> Apparently he does have violent pain, pain in the bowels. Well, one would. <laughs> this is also a case where in some reports, the servants start to feel unwell as well, because apparently they've snuck some of the food. Oh, yeah, so they're eating the leftovers or whatever. Well... Again, I took issue with this because it isn't widely reported. It's, it's in a couple of the reports that that happened. But again, who's eating gruel? Well, it's leftovers. You've got nothing else to eat. Well, maybe the servants are eating really well. Yeah, I mean, if he's eating gruel, what are the servants eating? Well, they're ordering in pheasants each week, hoping he'll have it. And they're just having roast dinners every night. I long for a gruel. No, I long for gruel. Yeah, but if he's having gruel, what the bloody hell yeah. are they left with? Twigs. Twigs. Twigs, Twigs and ice. <laughs> Yes, he is. He becomes violently ill. A doctor is called for. He comes into the house and he remarks to Mary, to the others, that the symptoms have all the hallmarks of poisoning. Yes. And finally a light bulb goes off in Mary's head. Oh my God. Oh, she now twigs. That oh she's my God, I've just put some stuff into his food. Well, she, she can only surmise that is what has happened. She hurries out of the room. She grabs the letters from William, along with what is left of the powders. And she runs and she throws him in the fire. She runs out of the room. But aha, a crafty maid <laughs> has spied her the whole time. It's always a crafty maid. Crafty maid and is has the foresight to snatch one of the parcels out of the fire. And the tests mm-hmm. will later show that the parcel did not contain a love potion. What a surprise. <laughs> it contained... Was it arsenic? It was arsenic! It was arsenic! <laughs> arsenic! Arsenic alarm! Arsenic alarm! Yes, it is a shit ton of arsenic. <laughs> That has been liberally sprinkled <laughs> in the gruel. In the gruel, and there's still residue in the gruel in the in the dish as well. So it's not as if Mary has come in and then cleaned it out. I yeah. mean, she's destroyed the evidence, if we are to believe her side of the story. Well, she's destroyed destroyed the evidence that implicates her. Mm. Not that. So yes, yeah, so if she's left it in the bowl and stuff like that. So she hasn't got rid of that. So then it could have been anyone who poisoned. She's just panicked. Yeah. She's panicked about the letters. That would implicate her and William and the oh, evidence yes. of the of the packet. So she immediately goes and throws them away. But all of this activity and this arse covering basically from her is too late for Francis, who realises he is dying and he is dying. Ooh. And this gets a bit sad, actually. And he calls for Mary. Mary comes in and he says, I'm dying. And Mary falls to her knees and is sobbing and crying. Oh, and she says she admits she put the powder in his food, but only because of William's instructions. And she tells him she didn't know what it was. She thought it would help. She begs and begs and begs her father for forgiveness, swears she will never see William again if he will only forgive her. And Francis does forgive her well, yeah. on his deathbed, while still saying words to the effect of, well, that was fucking stupid. You're an idiot daughter. You're an idiot daughter. But of course I forgive you. But 
he also says, Oh, such a villain to come into my house, eat of the best, drink of the best my house could afford, and in return, take away my life and ruin my daughter. So everyone always has very good last words. Well, I think actually my favourite last words of his, which were another report, is after he says this, he just says to her, go, go to your Uncle Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not funny, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> go and live with your Uncle Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> and Francis Blandy finally succumbs to the poison um, on the Wednesday. He was given the poison on the Sunday. A few days later, he is dead on the 14th of August, 1751. Sorry, he must have had some sort of instruction. Go to the police. Tell the police what's going well, on. Well, the doctor knows. Oh, the, the doctor, doctor, the knows. doctor knows. The doctor's and, and heard this yeah, confession. Yeah, this and has been. It was and... Yes, it is being reported right. now. William, upon hearing of the death, flees. Yes. Flees the country. Forgets about Mary. Drops her like a hot potato. That's, That's an expression. Yeah, that, that is a thing. <laughs> that is an expression. <laughs> and Mary is kept under house arrest. On suspicion of the murder of her father, mm. of the poisoning of her father, they know he's died, and they know they suspect foul play. But it's rather probably silly of her. She's burnt all these letters that prove that William told her to do it. Foolish Absolutely. woman! Yeah, she cannot prove that she was in, under instruction. She's ah. well, she's in the house, but she's absolutely racked with guilt by all accounts. Mm. She's she admits that she put the powder in there, but she's just trying to convince people that she didn't know what it was. She stays under house arrest for a while. She is allowed to walk out into Henley, but she is hated I'm by the locals. Sure. They chase her. They chase her through the streets. They chase her across a bridge um, into Berkshire at one point, which isn't that far, actually. <laughs> she doesn't run yeah, 70 it's just, miles. It's just like across the bridge. It's, across, it's literally across the bridge. Uh, she takes refuge in the uh, Little Angel Inn Aww. with a friend of hers. It's very sad and she's hiding there. Getting but eventually... Pissed. Getting pissed. Getting, just getting Bring on the cocktails! <laughs> dad is dead, dad is dead. <laughs> but it's not long before she is charged with murder. She is brought to trial... In Oxford, when she's brought to trial, she's, she, they put her in leg irons. There's one picture that shows her in leg irons, and she looks really splendidly turned out, but with dainty little leg irons <laughs> on. So, there's a lot of artistic license. Don't want her running away. Well, I know, but again, remember, treat everyone fairly, but this is a, a posh woman, essentially. Yes, she's, she's not, not a the, vagrant. Yes, but she's not, she's not that posh. She's not like mm. aristocracy or anything, is she? At the time, to have a murderer so. of that class was unusual yeah so I suppose they couldn't be seen to be giving preferential treatment I suppose well I don't think she was going to run but she has very very, very fetching, fetching I, I, was, I will put but the I'm picture sure up but I'm sort of like lace embossed leg irons or something. <laughs> yes so, very nice, dainty nicely, nicely padded on the inside so as to not to hurt the ankles <laughs> padded by the, the, the hands of the poor <laughs> At the trial, expert testimony is given by Dr. Anthony Addington. This is quite an important forensic case at the time, because again, we're in the 1700s. It's quite early. So early for anything like the Marsh Test, anything mm. else about really getting into forensics and the and the autopsies involved. And I won't go into the, the huge detail of the trial, because really in this day and age, it's pretty rudimentary, the tests that are carried out. But at the time, they were extraordinary. Um, the test that Dr. Addington did to find residue, for, uh, re- you know, trace residue of arsenic in the body and around the house, he's, it's enough to prove that arsenic was used and this man is dead. Dr. Addington actually went on, this, this case made his career, he went on to become the family doctor to William Pitt, Earl of oh, Chatham, and his son was Henry Addington, future Prime Minister. Mm-hmm. Even more fancy. There we are. Mary herself made an impassioned speech for her innocence at the trial. Um, In her own defence, she denied administering poison, but she admitted to putting powder in her father's food. And she claimed it had been given to her with another intent. But the servants go against her. The Mm. servants claim that they saw her administering the powder to her father's food and drink, and they saw her trying to destroy the evidence. Well, they did. So That's absolutely true. Doesn't look good, yeah, does it? Yeah, it doesn't. The trial lasts 13 hours. Oh, wow. Not very long, really, in no, comparison, that's though. incredibly speedy. And the jury swiftly convict her of murder, and she receives a mandatory death sentence. Mm. She stayed, She was kept in Oxford Castle for six weeks, treated well by her jailers. Um, her family were very upset to see her in there, obviously. Oh, but she was, she was very well behaved and she was quite calm. And I think on her first, uh, one of her 
first correspondence with her family, she just said, oh, I'm just a bit hungry. Can I have some mutton chops and apple pie? <laughs> and they brought her some. <laughs> uh, that could have been the cocktail mix there, mutton chops. I? <laughs> apple pie might have been easier. But no. Yeah, the apple pie would have been a good one. <laughs> I didn't think you had any apples in the house. That's a nice apple liqueur or something. Do you have any apple liqueur? I would have bought some better than that, but mine Drambuie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we are drinking creamy OT Drambuie nonsense. Yeah, I finished mine. <laughs> there we go. I've nearly finished it's mine. It's not nice. It's, it's not good. But she is then taken to the gallows on the 6th of April, 1752, wearing black bombazine. Mm, well, white. Yes, and That's black it. ribbons. So as she steps on the gallows, she briefly, as you're allowed to do, protests her innocence to a small crowd. It's only a small crowd there. And then she asks the hangman, for the sake of decency, gentlemen, don't hang me high. Oh. Because she was concerned. Because she's young... got no pants on. <laughs> She was concerned the young men in the crowd would look up her skirts if she was too high. <laughs> I, yeah, was she, was she just going commando? Or was she lifting up her skirts? Like, Don't hang me too high, boys! <laughs> As the noose was placed around her neck and a black cloth covered her face, she held a prayer book so she could say her final prayers. And she finished her prayer. She gave the signal by dropping her prayer book and the rope swung and Ooh. she died almost instantly. And it is said a blackbird perched on the beam during the hanging and that no blackbird has ever sung in that place since not only that but mary blandy's ghost now reportedly haunts the little angel inn where she took refuge and a figure in old-fashioned dress is often seen walking around the streets of henley and parts of oxford and around the oxford castle mound her skirts rustling in the wind (laughs) william yes what happened to that rogue obviously got away with murder but he fled to france on hearing of mary's arrest he joined a monastery and there are reports that he eventually, before joining the monastery, he flitted from place to place in France, but constantly pursued by people being chased with the threat of the repercussions of what he'd done. And he died at the monastery completely penniless later that year in 1752. Had William managed to marry Mary, he would never have gotten his hands on the £10,000 dowry because Blandy's entire estate amounted to less than £4,000. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which is why he was having the gruel. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, my God. Oh, my God. A nice postscript again from the Newgate calendar. Had not this corrupt twig of the noble branch of the tree of genealogy. Great line. From which he grew, spread his insidious snares to entangle the heart and corrupt the mind of Miss Blandy. She would not have been guilty of the abominable and unnatural crime of patricide. Young ladies should be cautious of listening to the insidious address of artful love as they know not how soon and how unsuspectedly their hearts may be engaged to their own destruction. Well, it's words we should, words we should all live by, I feel. You should all live all by. All live by those words. And that is the story of Mary Blandy. I, have not, I did not know that story. It is, it's, it's a sad one. It's a, it's a very sad story. I mean, boo to the captain. We don't like him. Um, boo to him boo well, to him we say boo, <laughs> boo to Nanny um, okay so there are two schools of thought about this mm. there is the school of thought that I have presented that Mary is an idiot but innocent but there are others and a lot of the newspapers reported at the time they didn't believe her well so there's only her if she's burnt these letters that supposedly say that are from the captain that say put this powder in your father's soup she's or oh, gruel <laughs> But she is the only one who has seen this letter, and then she burnt this letter. Mm-hmm. So there is no proof apart from her saying that someone else has told her to do this. Yep. So it's all down to, on her word that she has been given this by someone else. So yeah, I mean, it's absolutely entirely possible that she did do it all herself. It is known that she was um, w- t- walking out, let's say, with William, with the captain. Yes. Um, that he was a bit of a rogue and he was a bit of a bastard. So you've got independent people who write to the father to say, look, he's already married. We know he's trying to uh, wed your daughter and get his hands on the dowry. Um, Don't trust him. So we know that that relationship is taking place and it's, you know, and that he was married and that he was trying to uh, end his first marriage. There are court reports about him going to a court Mm. and constantly being turned down. Whether or not they conspired together, we don't know. But to what end? To get the money. Yeah, but he's he can't marry. But then he was he kept convincing her. Let's say she is stupid but evil, rather than stupid but innocent. Yeah. If he's saying, 
look, I will get this done. She doesn't know what's going up in the courts in Scotland. He's been spinning her a yarn for ages going, it's going to be, it's fine. It's all going to be annulled. He's just got to get the court sorted. But then he has another obstacle that the father is not going to allow the marriage. If the daddy's dead, then he get then they get the money when they wed. Oh, yeah, but only when they wed. Mm. I think there might have been, I'm not sure if there was a loophole that if they were betrothed, they were engaged, that he would be entitled to it. He'd be entitled to a share he of it. He still can't do that if he's married to someone else. No. Clearly he was not a clever man. Yeah. I mean, these are not e- evil not geniuses at work. Crimes. No, no, you're no, right. No, of you're all right. of these things, he is stupid enough that he thought he could hook up with someone else while he still had a wife and kid. He's arrogantly convinced that the courts will side with him and it's not happening and now he's arrogantly thinking well just d- just put the powder in there to teach him a lesson or the dad a lesson and he's dead and he's run away to France perhaps it was all her maybe it was thinking the fa- my father is standing in the way of me being with my beloved mm. therefore I will kill him she was probably very spoiled yes very spoiled I, d- I-, I think I side mm. on I side on that she was innocent mm. I think she was incredibly naive yeah and i think that's more likely that she was stupid because if she was if she was really evil and wanted to do it she probably would have plotted it better well yeah because obviously she was an educated woman she'd had an education mm. in her childhood so she wasn't she wasn't not yet she wasn't stupid she was naive. No. so and also if she if she wanted to get away with it she would have kept william's letter yes absolutely she would have said he, would he have, told me to do it <laughs> she would have had more proof yeah th- than that so i don't think she was an evil genius um but it, it just goes to show that he wasn't not that i could find he wasn't pursued william wasn't pursued it was just her she did it we it know that easy, she put it? the powder in there let's hang her a woman and it was big news you know let's let's show that the not the aristocracy but noble men and women mm. are susceptible to crime and they will be punished uh, i think what it's, 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 it's easy it's cut and dry mm. there we go don't have no, no effort in pursuing someone throughout Europe. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a godless place out there. Uh, it is. Exactly. So, uh, oh, there we go. Sad, Poor sad, Mary. Sad story. And maybe that's what she's the. That's the first one that we've got. I think that it's famous that her ghost haunts the areas. Yes. We don't have many ghosts, and we, we love a ghost story. But yeah, she reportedly haunts the the little angel in. There's another inn, I think she, there's there's loads of places that claim that she, she has been seen and that she walks the streets. And she's a great story to tell. I think a lot of ghost hunts around Oxford and other places, Mary Blandy's ghost, Mary Blandy's yeah. ghost. That's the first thing usually you see when you look up. She was a murderer. And, you know, I think she was wrongly accused. Well, she, she well, did no. kill her dad. She said, not wrongly accused. But she didn't know she was going to kill him. She thought he was, she was just going to make him a bit frisky. <laughs> and, and what I dare say, I said that even if that, she thought, okay, I'm going to give my father <laughs> a love potion. How does that work? I don't know. How, how does that, what benefits <laughs> does one have from that? Either for her, that's weird, um, <laughs> or her husband-to-be, that's also weird. Uh, just incredible stupidity and naive, um, naivety on that part. You don't, your father not a worldly wisdom. Those characters. No. <laughs> <laughs> she probably just thought it would make him a bit merry, like a glass of sherry. Well, give him a glass of sherry. Then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll never know. How do you win people over, dear listeners? <laughs> I thought you were asking me. Well, I will ask you. How do you win people you over? A, a, glass of, a glass of sherry. A glass of, <laughs> do you not have any sherry? I have got sherry. Have you got sherry? Mm. Never once offered me a glass of sherry because I hate it. <laughs> so you give people a glass of sherry. I hate this. Drink it. Yeah. It's piss. Because some, some people like it. Other but people like mad. it. <laughs> I'll give them really strong cocktails. I know you do, and then we die. Yes, but it's fun. It's fun. It's your way of killing <laughs> us with kindness. What do you think of the story of Mary Blandy? People, do you think she was innocent, or do you think she was evil? As always, share your thoughts with us on the social media. The social media. The just social the, just the media. One. The social media. The social media. All the social media is in one big pot. They will all become one soon. They will merge into a website called www.thesocialmedia.com. That's what I know. <laughs> oh, I think we sound so old now. Like, you are what's old. the social media? I'm so put much it younger on, than you. Uh, put it. Put it on the Twitter book. There it is. <laughs> go on the Twitter book. Put it on the interweb. Yes. <laughs> go on, on MySpace. And friends reunited and leave us reviews. 
<laughs> or I used to have a Friends Reunited page. Yeah, I did too. That was, it was a, a sad, sad place, wasn't it? <laughs> nothing happened. Well, I mean, you can go onto Friends Reunited, people, if you still have your accounts active, and talk about the Poisonous <laughs> Cabinet. Or, alternatively, please come and talk to us on our actual social media channels. Leave us reviews on Apple Podcasts. Please, please, please do that. If you haven't done it yet, just make this today the day that you do it. It would be <laughs> so appreciated. We could use some more reviews. And come and find out about Patreon. Come and see us yes. on our Patreon channel. We have tiers on there, so if you are able to support us you've got two levels you can choose you don't have to do it forever obviously but you get lots more content from us and we'd love to hear your suggestions of what we can do for you in exchange for your love and support so uh yeah our interesting cocktail which i have actually managed to finish but i don't think i'll be having another one but it'll be out on the social medias um, <laughs> <laughs> this evening so do Give it a try, if you dare. And you have that bizarre list of ingredients to hand. <sighs> Don't go out and buy a bottle of Drambuie just no. for this. It's really not worth it. Um, but squeeze some oats. That's quite fun. Um, make some oat milk. It's make lovely. some oat milk. Yeah, if you do decide to investigate, I would love to hear your thoughts because it's a really weird one. Yeah, make a variation on it. I think this so, is one to mess about with. But also, again, as we said, oat milk is now a thing. I drink oat milk all the time. I don't really drink dairy milk anymore. And I will sometimes have a have a little drop of Kalua in my oat milk. Nine in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get me going in the morning. Yeah. Who needs a coffee when you've got Kalua? <laughs> Another reason to break up the agonizing existence that is my life. Oat milk, the greatest poison of them all. Thank you so much for bearing with us for another poisonous cabinet ramble we have been the people inside the poisonous cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you bye bye